Well, while others are gathering in, we'll maybe make we start with uh, 203. Hymn 203, the first two verses, please. I was sinking deep in sin. Next one there, 204, again the first two verses.
88. We turn to 88 and we'll sing maybe the first and the second verse and seven and eight. First two and last two of hymn number 88. singing and we're going to continue with your opening hymn this evening which is 281 281 there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains and we're going to stand and worship the Lord after the introduction let's truly lift our voices in praise
Let us unite our hearts together as we come before the Lord tonight. We need his help and his presence, his power. And we would ask the people of God to pray that the Lord will come and visit us here in this church tonight. Our loving God and our gracious Heavenly Father, we do still ourselves afresh this evening before the throne of sovereign grace. We thank thee for the access that we have and through the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee we can say with the words of the hymn writer, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. We thank thee for the words of scripture that tell us the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. And we are so glad tonight that we have a gospel to proclaim that there is power in the blood. There is a way for sinful man to be right before a holy God. There is a gospel that brings good news to sinners if they will repent of their sin and put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's no wonder that night the angels sang glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. We give glory to God tonight for the plan of salvation. We're so thankful, Lord, for this gospel that offers salvation to the whosoever. And tonight we freely stand in this pulpit and we say, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. O oh Lord, give sinners tonight a sense of urgency, a sense of importance to call upon the name of the Lord that they might be saved from their sin. O oh Lord, we pray that thy spirit will move in our gathering tonight and bring sinners to Christ. Unite families in the Lord. Stir the hearts of thy people. O oh Lord, maybe there's a need that nobody else in this meeting knows about, but the Lord knows about it. We pray that through the preaching of thy precious word and through what is done in this service, that that need will be met tonight in Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, we thank thee and we praise thee that the one message can be preached from a pulpit and yet the Spirit of God can apply it effectually in different ways to hearts in the gathering. Oh, give us a desire, Lord, to hear thy voice tonight. Give thy people a hungering, a longing after righteousness. And may we each leave this building saying, it was good for me to be here because I have met afresh with the Lord tonight. We thank thee, Lord, for the communion feast that will take place at the end of the meeting. We do pray, Lord, that this will be a very special time where the Lord draws graciously near, where our hearts are warmed and when we're reminded afresh of what Christ has done for us in Calvary. Oh, we think all of the words of the hymn writer, lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget even Calvary. Oh, Lord, come, we pray. Take us to Calvary afresh tonight. Help us to see something more of what it meant for our Saviour to suffer and die there as a substitute for sinners. Lord, we pray that tonight will be owned of thee, that all that's said and done will bring glory and honour to thy name. And our prayer is, O oh Lord, that we would see Jesus tonight. Remember those, Lord, who can't be here. We think of those who mourn. We think of those who are ill tonight, maybe aged and infirm. We pray, Lord, for thy blessing to be in their homes. We pray, Lord, for as they would watch on tonight or maybe later on in the week on a DVD, we pray, Lord, that thou will encourage thy children. And we pray, O oh Father, that they would know that the Lord is ministering to their heart tonight. We pray, Lord, for those who could be here but just aren't. Pray, Lord, that you will give a hunger and a longing to be in the house of God. And we also pray, Lord, that you'll bless the work of God here. We pray for the Sunday school. We pray for the work among the boys and girls in the school. 
We pray, O Lord, for the outreach of this congregation. We pray that in all things they will know the blessing of God and the help and the strength of the Lord. We do pray that thou wilt bring a man across the mind of this congregation, man of thy own choosing, Lord, and bring congregation and man together that the work of God will go forward. And we do pray for denomination as a whole. We remember those vacant churches tonight. And, O Lord, we pray you will fill those vacancies. We remember our retired ministers tonight. I pray, Lord, that you will bless them, and, Lord, that thou wilt be pleased to encourage them in their senior years. We thank tonight, Lord, of our presbytery. We pray, Lord, for thy guidance and wisdom and direction for the days that lie ahead. And may the work of the Free Presbyterian Church know the blessing of God, and may it be strengthened in the days that lie ahead, and may we see much ground taken for the Lord Jesus Christ in these days. Lord, take away all distractions tonight. Take away thoughts not convenient for the season. Take away, Lord, those fleeting things that would come in and then distract us for many minutes. Oh, Lord, we pray tonight that thou wilt just take us up with the things of God. And may we hear thy word, know thy will, and be found obedient as we even leave this house, walking in the center of the will of God. Bless us now, we pray. All meet with us, we ask. In Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen and amen. Hymn of Challenge 224. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? We'll stand and sing this lovely gospel hymn together.
Let's turn in God's word to Psalm 113. Psalm 113. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high, who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill, that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. He maketh a barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. And the Lord is, of course, worthy of the best of our praise. I've been asked tonight to sing. I don't usually do solos. Uh, I usually am singing with my wife or with uh, a couple of other fellows, but I've been asked to sing tonight, and therefore I'm going to ask you as a congregation to join with me in the chorus of this uh, song, There is Coming a Day. is coming a day when no heartache shall come no more clouds in the sky no more tears to dim the eye all is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore what a day Glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me through the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no more pain. No more parting over there, and forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus. I shall see, and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day, that will be. What a day, glorious day, that will be. There's a lovely little song. It was actually written as a a poem for the back of a gospel tract. 
and it simply asks the question, have you thought about your soul? And someone some time ago put it to a very familiar hymn in her hymn book, and it works very well. And I just want you to listen to the words of this song. And I challenge you tonight, if you're not saved, have you ever thought about your soul? Where you're going, where you'll be five seconds after you die. I trust and pray that the Lord will cause you to think tonight and to ensure that your soul is safely in the hands of the Lord. That's all that matters. Have you ever stopped to wonder what this life is all about? Why you're here and where you're going when your lease of life runs out? Maybe you've been far too busy trying hard to reach your goal. Would you let me ask you kindly, have you thought about your soul? You may reach the highest portal, and your dreams may all come true. Wealth and fame may be your fortune, and success may come to you. All your friends may sing your praises, not a care on you may roll. What about the great tomorrow? Have you thought about your soul? If you've never thought it over, spend a little time today. There is nothing more important that will ever come your way than the joy of sins forgiven and to know you've been made whole in the name of Christ the Savior won't you think about your soul. We'll ask our brother to come and bring the announcements. Well, it's a joy to welcome each and every one who has joined with us this evening for our gospel service. We trust that you'll know the Lord's blessing. Those who are joining us remotely on our platforms, we're glad also to welcome you this evening. It's a joy to have the Reverend Ryan McKee with us again this evening. Our brother labours for the Lord in our Mark Rafael congregation. We thank him for singing and we thank him for the message he brought this morning and we trust the Lord will bless you again this evening, brother, as you minister the word. Do you remember that immediately following this evening's meeting, we will be meeting around the Lord's table. It's the Lord that gives the invitation. And if you're saved and walking with the Savior, then you are invited to join with us around his table. We do ask that those ladies who do have their head covered as not to do so would be a cause of offence. Some announcements made as always subject to the Lord's will. Do remember the bi-monthly prayer meeting for our school is tomorrow night at 8pm. 
And on Tuesday night at 8, our prayer meeting and Bible study takes the form this week of a deputation meeting on behalf of Let the Bible Speak. This Wednesday night at 7 is the last practice for our children's meeting before the prize giving, which will be held the following Wednesday. And we encourage the children and the young people to come along and to practice, please, on Wednesday night. Friday at 7.30 is our Sunday school prize giving. The children and young people of our Sunday school will be taking part. Miss Joyce Walsh will be along to bring a word and refreshments uh, will be afterwards in the complex and everyone is invited to remain for those refreshments and that time of fellowship. In connection with that, could we ask the congregation, please, if you could assist us. You always rise to the occasion with some tray bakes, buns and bars, all those sort of items, uh, please, for Friday night. Saturday at 7.30 is the open air in the lower square. Do you remember the meetings of next Lord's Day, 9 a.m., the early season of prayer, 10.30, our Sunday school and Bible class, and then the Reverend Andrew Murray from our Ardara Free Presbyterian Church. He will be along to bring the word at the adult Bible class, commencing at 10.45, and also at our morning service, commencing at 12. The 7 p.m. service, our interim moderator, the Reverend Henderson, will be along to minister the word. Just a couple of other things to finally mention to you uh, in relation to the watch night service that will be held in our Unalong congregation. Of course, we join with them even for that time. And it's hoped to have a combined men's group to sing at the watch night service. And any men from the congregation here who wish to participate, if you could please contact me in the next few days, I'll be very happy to uh, provide you with fuller details. We should have said this morning that the annual report, uh, uh, copies of it are on the table. Please do take a copy as you leave. And then finally, uh, those of you with mission boxes, let the Bible speak, or school boxes, if you could please bring those in so that they could be counted even before the end of the year. That would be greatly appreciated. Well, once again, thank you for the invitation to be here and for the fellowship and the gospel, and we do appreciate that very much in the Saviour's name. And we trust and pray that the Lord will speak tonight as we open his word in just a few moments' time. We want to sing just one more hymn before we come to the preaching of God's word, and that is hymn 215, 215. A testimony hymn. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. And there was mercy, there was grace, there was pardon found at Calvary. And praise the Lord, tonight there's still mercy and grace and pardon found in the work of Christ. And if you will but come, pleading uh, his finished work, pleading his precious blood, you too can be saved and be able to sing this with us, that now I've given to Jesus everything, now I gladly own him as my king. Isn't it wonderful to be able to sing that tonight? If you're saved, then really lift your voice and praise because of what Christ has done for us at Calvary. The offering be lifted during this hymn. <laughs>
We're turning in God's word this evening to Psalm 90. Psalm number 90. We want to hear the word of God from this chapter of the scriptures. Psalm 90, commencing to read at verse number 1. Let's hear the word of God. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with the flood, they are as asleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth, and groweth up, and in the evening it is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is our strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so was thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy word. We do pray that, Lord, thou wilt speak to us through it. We rejoice that there is mercy with thee. Lord, we rejoice that thou art the dwelling place of the righteous. And our cry this evening is that thou would empty me of self and sin and fill me with thy spirit. Give me help to deliver the word of God to this congregation to the honour and glory of thy name. We pray, O Lord, that thou would move, thou would speak, thou would rescue, thou would change. People in this gathering tonight, we look to thee, O Lord, for vain is the help of man. But we thank thee for that wonderful promise, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. May we be strengthened tonight in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. The words teach us are used a number of times in scripture. Teach us. For example, in Judges chapter 13, verse 8, we have the verse, teach us what we shall do unto the child. And you know, the word of God does give us instruction on how to raise children. Parents are given instruction on how to raise their children on the fear and admonition of the Lord. Train up a child in the way he shall go. There are various verses that are given for the raising of children, for the educating of children, and for the preaching unto children. And it's interesting, whenever you go, especially into the Old Testament, you'll find that whenever the congregation gathered, it is the Holy Spirit takes care to emphasize that the children were there as well. At those wonderful times, at the dedication of the temple, it was the men, the woman, and the children. They stood and they heard the word of the Lord being read and proclaimed. Of course, in the New Testament, we see the Lord Jesus Christ himself saying, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of God. And therefore, we know that children should receive the word of God. They can receive it and they can be saved. And we say amen to that. And therefore, if you want to be a faithful and godly parent, then we pray these words, teach us what we shall do unto the child. And may the Lord give the parents wisdom in this congregation. But then we also have those words, teach us in scripture. In Isaiah 2 verse 3, it says, he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. And there's a verse for every child of God. The Lord does teach us his truth through his word. He has revealed his truth. He has revealed his will. And the responsibility of man is that we will walk in his paths. There is no more blessing than to walk in the paths of God, to walk in the ways of God. And I trust that that's what you're doing tonight. You're in the ways of God. You see, Scripture teaches us how to live before God. And then in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Lord, teach us to pray. 
Now, there are times in Scripture where the disciples were instructed on what to pray. But it says, teach us to pray. Lord, show us the importance of prayer. How needful it is in our lives, in our ministries, and in our work. So teach us about raising children. Teach us the way in which we should live. Teach us to pray. And then we come to Psalm 90. And in verse number 12, we have the words, teach us again. And it says, teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Now, Psalm 90 is speaking about a man's life, about his life and about his limitations. Sometimes when we're in the full bloom of youth or health, we feel that we have no limitations at all. But the Bible teaches us about our limitations. It's interesting to note that even this is a prayer of Moses, the man of God. This is a psalm of Moses. Uh, many people, uh, when you say the psalms, they think of David. But there were various writers of the psalms, and one of them was Moses. And here we have uh, a word that was given to Moses by the Holy Spirit, recorded here for us in Scripture in Psalm 90. And I want us to think of this theme and this thought, teach us to number our days using three simple headings. Well, first of all, before we start with our first heading, what do those words actually mean? Well, the word number, it means to weigh out or to prepare. So the call here is that we may weigh out our days or prepare our days, that they'll be used wisely. The word teach means to acknowledge, to be aware, to discern or to understand. And the Lord can give us that wisdom to realize that our days are brief. They are limited. And that's our very first thought tonight, the bounds of our days. You see, the days that we have are given to us by the Lord. And in that very truth, we see something of the power of God. He has created each of us here tonight. Each of us who are sitting in this gathering, living, breathing, human beings with a soul, God has created us. And whenever you think about that, and about the complexity of the human body, and about how wonderfully it works together, think about the eye, and every little vein that had to be placed in the eye, and the lens, and every single thing that God has created within the eye, the very uh, way that it is uh, kept moist and all of those things. The Lord has designed every single detail about our eye impeccably. The fact that you can see tonight tells us about the power of God, about the fact that you're able to see what's in front of you, to allow that to send a message to your mind, to interpret what you're seeing all within a split second. The Lord has created us. Every organ placed within your body Every vein placed carefully, knit together in our mother's womb. Whenever no one knew us, the Lord was creating us and putting our members where they ought to be. God alone is the creator of life. And God alone can take life. And for anybody else to step in and try and take the place of God is the greatest of sin. And we've seen in our land... This past week, the emphasis with all the things that are wrong in our nation and all the things that could be focused on and improved, the emphasis, the passion of certain individuals is that abortion will be freely available here. Going to a hospital, the place set up where life is preserved and treatment is given, for the murder of an unborn baby. This is a tragedy. This is judgment in our land. And what a fearful thing it will be for a man or woman who facilitated it, promoted, encouraged it to stand before the living God, the creator and the giver of life. Do you realize as you sit in this meeting tonight, God has given you physical life. But we also see the providence of God because the Lord has ordained the place that you will be born, the time you will be born, 
the generation in which you would be born, the family into which you would be born, and the circumstances of your birth. You are not a mistake. God has ordained that you're here at this time, living your life as you're living it. He has detailed also the very second of your death. The Lord knows exactly that moment when you will be called from this scene of time, whether swiftly, without any warning, or whether having to lie in ill health for some time. The Lord has ordained the bounds of your life. So what are the practicalities of this truth? That God has a beginning and an end for the physical life of each of his created individuals. Well, first of all, life is for a limited time. Life is for a limited time. And I know, humanly speaking, we don't like talking about that or we don't like maybe focusing or thinking about it. But let's be honest tonight. Life is for a limited time. You're not going to be here forever and I am not going to be here forever. And unless the Lord comes in our lifetime, we will die. Not only that, but life is precious. Life is precious. And we ought to treat life very preciously. We think of those who go and take the life of another in this world. We think of those who push drugs and alcohol, immorality, all these different things into the minds of young people, painting it up as life, painting it up as all that the world has to offer, destroying the life that God has given. Life is precious. Life is a gift from God, and life will come to an end. My question to you, before we go any further in this meeting, is where will you be when your life comes to an end? Where will you be in eternity? Because your time is limited. Not only do we see the bounds of our days in this verse teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts on to wisdom, We see the brevity of our days. Because in the Bible, time and time and time again, we have descriptions of life. For example, we've already uh, read in this passage, verse number nine, uh, we spend our years as a tale that is told. It was a tale, it's a short story. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. You close the book and you put it away and forget about it. I often think whenever I consider the brevity of our days, you go back 100 years ago, there were people living in this town. Maybe there was some type of a dwelling on this place, or maybe they were farming in this place. And for those people, they were the people who lived there at that time. They knew others in the town. They maybe ran various aspects of the businesses of the town. But you know what? If I asked you to name them tonight, you couldn't. Because while their life made an impact in their day and in their generation, they are now passed away. They're gone. And the reality is, if the Lord should spare spare and tarry for another 100 years, there'll be people sitting in the very pew that you're sitting in that know absolutely nothing about you and nothing about me. See, life is so brief, it's a tale that's told. It's like the grass that... Uh, flourisheth, it groweth up for a little while, and then it is cut down. Elsewhere in Scripture, I believe it's in the book of James, it's like a vapor that appears for a little while, and then vanisheth away. And you know as the kettle is steaming, it just appears for a few seconds, and then it's away. It can't be lengthened, it can't be kept, it just disappears. And the reality is, the Bible makes great effort to teach us that our life is Brief. We think of the man in scripture in Luke 12, the rich farmer. And there's nothing wrong with being rich. There is absolutely nothing wrong with being successful in business. But he lived as if he was going to live forever. And the plans and the preparation he made were as if he was always going to be around. He had not enough room to store 
all his crops. And what a nice problem to have. So he decided to pull down his barns and build bigger. That's not sinful, that's wise. But the great problem was this. He left God out of his plans. There was no thought of God. There was no thought of his soul. There was no thought of eternity. He only focused on the physical. Then I'll say to my soul, eat, drink, and be merry. He envisaged many years sitting with his feet up, having made his fortune. He presumed on tomorrow, but he had a very limited time. He left God out, and God was the one before whom he would have to stand. And the Lord said to him that night, Thou fool, thou fool, this night thy soul should be required of thee. And you say, what a fool. Why did he not make preparation? And yet you're in God's house tonight. You're in God's house tonight and you're not saved. You've come to this church for years and you've heard the gospel. You know that only the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ can cleanse away your sin. Maybe at times you've even been troubled. You need to take your eyes off the fool in scripture. And realize if you sit tonight with a knowledge about salvation, yet still in your sin, you're a fool sitting in more and free Presbyterian church. Because you have no more guarantee of tomorrow than this man had. You don't know, but in this meeting tonight, the Lord could be saying, Thy soul could be required of thee this night. What then? When your brief life is over, what then? Some people assume because in their teens or in their twenties that they have the lifetime ahead of them and we pray that it is so, but you don't have to be old today. You can be closer to eternity and we probably all are than we would ever imagine. You see, there's the description of the brevity, there's the example of brevity, but there's also the personal witness. Death is all around us. We know people in our senior years. And we go and we speak to them, some in their hundredth year, and you say to them, what's it like to be that age? And you know what they say? It's just a flash. Where did that century go? It's a flash. They can't believe that they've reached that age because it's just gone by so quickly. And yet while we think of those in those senior years, there are those we know of infants and young who've been called into eternity. Let's be honest, whenever there's something wrong with our body now and we go for tests, we are fearful. Whether it's the slightest ache or pain or discomfort, we're fearful until the doctor comes back with the results. We're being sent for tests. We're wondering, could this be it? Could I be dying? Yet we get better, and then we go on. You do not have to be old to die. You do not have to be sick to die. You do not have to be weak to die. My friend, you do need to be prepared. You need to be ready. Because as sure as you're sitting here tonight in this church, there is a day appointed for your death. And after this, the judgment. Thirdly, we thought about the bounds of our days. We thought about the brevity of our days. Let's think about the blessings of our days. Because it says, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts onto wisdom. And first of all, I want to speak to the saved in this meeting. Those who have trusted Christ as Savior. May you be wise in the days that you have left. May you be wise in the way that you spend those days. Remember that every day God gives you is a precious day to walk with God. Every day that God gives you is a precious day to work for God. And every day God gives you is a precious day to worship 
the Lord. I love one of my favorite verses in scriptures. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And you know, I have met people and they are living for this day in the future when everything's good and everything's perfect and everything's right. And then they're going to enjoy their life. They're going to serve God then. They're going to give their best then. But the Bible says this is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And if God has given you today, then he is worthy of your praise, child of God. If God has given you today, there is a purpose. We are called to the kingdom for such a time as this. There's a lovely song that says, I want my life to count for Jesus. All earthly things will fade away. And dear child of God, don't wait until your children are growing and then commit to the work. Don't wait until you've got that job or you've got this or that or you've got into this house and then you'll commit to the prayer meeting and you'll commit to going through with God. This is the day that the Lord hath made. You may not get another one. And therefore ensure that should the Lord come or call, he'll find you serving. He'll find you praising. He'll find you faithful. But I want to say to the unsaved in this meeting, and by the word unsaved, I mean those who have never trusted Christ for salvation. And as I look upon your face, I know not how you stand before God. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. I want to say to you that today, for the unsaved, this is a day of opportunity. It is a day for you to prepare to meet your God. You see, you need to be saved. As I sang a few moments ago, you go through life and get the highest accolades and fame and fortune and people singing your praises. But what about the great tomorrow? What about that moment? Because as sure as heaven is real, so is hell. As sure as God's mercy is real, so is his justice. As sure as the peace and the joy of heaven is real for eternity, so is the wrath of God upon your soul in a lost sinner's hell. And I warn you, and I urge you, you need to be saved. Not by baptism, because that doesn't save. Not by church attendance, because that doesn't save. Not by cleaning up your life, because that doesn't save. But by coming as a repentant sinner to the Lord Jesus Christ, calling upon him to save you from your sin. And to wash you in his precious blood that he shed in Calvary. Lord, I believe that you died on the cross for me. I believe that the blood can save and I pray that you'll cleanse me now. Friend, that's what you need to do. You need to call upon the name of the Lord tonight. We often say, boast not thyself of tomorrow. For thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You might not even make it home tonight. You may not make it home tonight. I praise the Lord you can leave this meeting knowing that it's well with your soul if you come to Jesus. This is a day of opportunity because the Bible says my spirit will not always strive with man. And if you are concerned about your soul, do not harden your heart. If you hear the call of the gospel, and there is always a call of the gospel whenever the word is open and the gospel is preached. Do not harden your heart. If you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. You need to be saved tonight. There's danger. There's death. There's devastation. There's damnation in hell just up ahead. And sinner, you're a heartbeat away from it tonight. You're a breath away from it tonight. And we urge you to flee from the wrath to come, for it is coming. You'll not be the exception. You'll not be the one who escapes. The only way of safety is whenever you're sheltered in Christ. Wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. 
You see, the wise and the foolish are contrasted in Scripture. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Believing what he says and acting upon it, that is the beginning of wisdom. We think in the New Testament of the Lord Jesus speaking the parable about the wise man and the foolish man. And what did they do? They went to build a dwelling place. The foolish man built his dwelling place in the sand. I'm sure it was beautiful. It was on the coast. I'm sure it was very pleasing to the eye and very pleasurable to live in. But when the storm came, it didn't stand the test. It fell. It failed him. Friend, if you're living in this world for pleasure, if you're living in this world for the things that it has to offer, they will fail you in the end. You'll be in hell with nothing to show for a life that's been wasted. But if you like the wise man, build upon the rock. And the rock is Christ Jesus, the solid foundation, the sure foundation. And praise the Lord, nothing and no one can move you from that foundation. God does not demand judgment twice. God does not demand judgment twice. And if you have trusted in Christ as your saviour and he has borne the punishment for your sin upon the cross, you will never be asked to pay for it because Jesus paid it all. I say God does not demand judgment twice, but he does demand judgment And the life that you've lived against him and without him, God will call you out. Perhaps there's someone saying, maybe on my deathbed I'll get saved. Maybe later in life, maybe whenever we get a minister here and we get him established and all, then I'll get saved. Maybe when I've enjoyed my life, then I'll get saved, friend. You do not understand the urgency tonight. You need to be saved now. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The brevity of your life means you need to be certain now because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. I heard of a minister who went to go and visit someone on their deathbed. And they knew that person needed to be saved and they knocked the door and they asked to see them. And the family member who answered the door wouldn't allow the minister into the house to speak to the person because they were too ill. Going out into God's eternity without a saviour. And somebody stand at the door forbidding a minister to come in and preach the gospel. What an awful day it will be for that person to stand before God. You see, on your deathbed, you're not even guaranteed the opportunity. But as you sit in God's house tonight, mercy is great. Grace is free. Pardon is available for you tonight. Dear friend, you can be saved. And I urge you and I beg you, do not leave this meeting without Christ. Do not leave without the Savior. What a tragedy it would be if this being your final meeting, you said no to the Lord. Wasted your days and entered hell without God and without hope. You need to be saved. At the end of this meeting, one of the elders will be at the door. Would you like to speak to myself or to one of the elders, please let that be known. We certainly would love to show you from God's word how you can be saved. We can't save you, but we can show you how you can be saved. Or even as we sing our final hymn, would you bow your head and just pray, Lord, save me a sinner. This is too urgent. This is too important. For you to leave tonight. Don't play about with your soul. But come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. The hymn is 227.
Is there a heart that is waiting? Longing for pardon today, hear the glad message proclaiming, Jesus is passing this way. We're going to pray just before we sing, and then we're going to sing, and then after that, those who are not staying for the communion service are free to leave, but certainly we do want to just commit the word of God afresh in prayer, and pray that the Lord will use it for his glory. Heavenly Father, we think of the solemnity of the meeting tonight. We realize that there are those in this gathering who are not yet saved. And perhaps, O oh Lord, there's a battle going on within the heart. We pray that grace will be given, deciding grace, that they may call upon the name of the Lord and know the joy of sins forgiven. We thank thee that there is a Savior who truly saves and truly satisfies. Save, Lord, in this meeting tonight. Even in the closing hymn, we ask for thy glory alone. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.